Good morning, church. Hey, uh, welcome. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Rockbridge Church, and this is week two in our series called Work in Progress, Why God Matters to Work and Why Work Matters to God. Everybody hear me now? Everybody cool? Hey, uh, so this is week two. Week one, we talked, we started this last week. Uh, it just... FYI, we could not cover everything there is to know about building this practical biblical theology of work in one week. So if you missed last week, man, go back and look at the notes or listen to it. At least get the cliff notes from somebody uh, because we're going to be moving forward, progressing in this sermon series each week, and it's going to be building. So that's where we are. Today, we're going to be in Colossians 3. We're going to be breaking down two verses in Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. And we should go, the sermon should last about 34 and a half minutes. So if you're wondering. Okay. All right. This is what Colossians 3 says in verse 23 and 24. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. As we're talking about this idea of work and what it means and what God has for it and how God should influence and shape work, I wanted to start with a question. It's a question that we all get asked growing up at least a thousand times. Anybody, can anybody guess what it is? What do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, usually we're just looking for ideas for ourselves when we ask that, right? Uh, I can tell you, when I was a kid, the first thing I wanted to be from an early age was a farmer. Farmer Matt. That's me and Uncle Larry. And boy, could we tell some stories about him. Uh, That we are actually building a barn. He put me to work. I'm, what, five years old? And he's like, yeah, go ahead. Get up there. Start framing that sucker out. Thus the broken arm, maybe. I don't know. Uh, So then I figured out that uh, farmers never get to take a vacation pretty ever. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to just follow my dad's footsteps and I want to be a preacher, Preacher, Matt. Gosh, that's embarrassing. There I was. And then I figured out how mean Christians can be. And I was like, I do not want to be a preacher. (laughs) So then I decided I know what I'll do. I'll be an artist. (laughs) That is not a wig. That is my real hair. Oh my gosh. And then I figured out that artists don't make money until after they're dead. So I decided that I would become an architect. There he is. And then I decided, uh, and then I learned that you have to use math to be an architect. And I was so bad at math, guys. Like, really, I am horrible. I took college math. Like, literally, I went to college and the name of the course was college math. Not algebra, not pre-calculus, not, it was called math. That's how bad at math I was. The teacher, Mr. Bowers, wasn't even a professor. He was like a retired middle school math teacher. And I still almost failed the class. I was like, please pass me. He's like, if you promise to never do math ever again, I will let you go. I was like, I I promise so much. (sighs) So what did you want to be when you, grow, when you grow up? I think that question is actually revealing, isn't it? What do you want to be? Be when you grow up. So literally, our culture has been so brainwashed and ingrained that, that, uh, that what we do equals who we are, that we even start by just the, the very earliest age trying to like indoctrinate our children into that concept, that, that whatever you're going to do is going to equal who you are as a human being. And our work actually so often, very many times, becomes our identity. And when work, what we do becomes who we are, when work is our identity, folks, at some point, the wheels start to fall off. And here's what happens. When work begins to define us, when who we are is defined by what we do, number one, our work will become our main source of validation. 
And we become dominated by either pride or insecurity or both. You ever known a, you ever known a prideful, insecure person? Whew. And really what we start to think is only some work, really important work, should be deemed as having dignity. And then when we, we're, we're constantly going to our work to receive validation, our performance will derive from a place of obligation. And our temperament is going to rise and fall with our successes and our failures. And listen, we got to succeed at all costs because we're only as valuable as our last sale. So we got to perform. No matter what, we got to. And then when that happens, our sense of worth becomes dominated by what other people think, by what other people think of us, by, the, by their perception. And we live in this constant awareness of what others might think. And then people-pleasing becomes our modus operandi, and we, instead of serving God, serve man. And someday, our work ends, and we have a crisis of identity. And there's got to be a better way. And man, if you're in college right now, or you're in high school, or you're just starting out in your career, Man, if we can figure this out now and not when you're 45 or 65, it's a game changer. Thank you. Spoken from experience, maybe, right? Yeah. So, here's the thing. The gospel gives us a new way to work. It is a new way to work because it gives us a new identity in Christ without which work will end up defining you some way. So let's look at this Colossians chapter 3 verse, and, and we're going to get to verses 22 and 20, uh, I'm sorry, 20 through, 23 and 24, but I want to start at the beginning of that chapter because so it's going to give us some context to what we're talking about. So it says this in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ then set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Listen to this. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you, will also, then you also will appear with him in glory. What a beautiful way of reminding us now where our, our identity lies. Our life is now hidden with Christ in God. We are, we are new creations. The old is gone. The new is here. And that means there's a whole new identity that we receive. And that means there's a whole new way to live and to work as followers of Jesus. Skip down to Colossians 3 verses 12 and 16, and then he starts to give us a picture of what this new identity looks like. And he gives us two examples. The first one, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. I want you to bear with each other and forgive one another. Okay, so the first picture of this new identity, he says that you are a chosen people. And he gives us these two descriptors for that, right? He says a chosen people who are both holy. That word holy simply means that you have been set apart. You are a chosen people set apart by God through Christ. And then he says, and you're also not just set apart, but you are dearly loved. You are chosen people, holy and dearly loved. That means before you had an inkling of loving God, he loved you like crazy beforehand. He says, okay, therefore now as God's chosen people, your belonging, your purpose, your identity, this is all coming into uh, perspective because of Christ. And then skip down to verse 15, and let the peace of Christ, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace. So he says, hey, you're not only a chosen people, but now he says, and you're also members of the body, of one body, and that body is called the church. Isn't that cool that Jesus makes us members? We are the body of Christ, he says, where each part has value and purpose and belonging 
And it's there for us. It's given. It's, it, it, it's given to us, the church. We're going we're gonna to circle back to that because I think there's some great application pieces in that chunk. But now I want to then move to verses 23 and 24. So, 23 and 24 say, So whatever you do, work at it with all your hearts as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. That, uh, that little phrase there, since you know, kind of means that verse 24 is what gives perspective to verse 23. Does that make sense? Like, Whatever 23 is saying, we're able to do that since we know what verse 24 is saying. Get that? So let's break down verse 24. I know it's backwards, but I want to break down verse 24 first because verse 24 allows us to have the proper context of verse 23. So verse 24 says this, Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it's the Lord Christ you are serving. Okay, so as we look at this, uh, anybody else start to get a little confused? As I look at this, this verse can start to be really like, what, wait, what did this just say? Like, is this saying, does he just, did he just say, does this mean, hey, work hard and you're going to get to heaven as your reward, right? Does that like, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. You're telling me that I just became a Christian. Okay. And I, I have to move now because I, I was working to please people who I can sometimes fool. But now you're saying I have to work really hard to please God who I will never fool ever. Awesome. Thanks a lot. This is not what this is saying. And it can really easily be misunderstood. So it's really important that we actually get a proper understanding of what, 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 what actually verse 24 means. Let's break this down. And the key word that we have to key on for understanding what this is actually saying is this word right here. Inheritance. Notice he didn't say, and you're going to receive a payout as your reward. He uses the word inheritance. And the word inheritance has a completely different connotation, a completely different understanding, a completely different meaning. Even in that culture, in that context, that word is powerful. Because what's an inheritance? It's not something that you earn. It's not something that you got to work for. It's a gift. Bestowed from parent to child, not because of what they have done, but because of who they are. Are. And that starts to totally reshape work. Uh, Galatians, let's, let's go to Galatians chapter 3, because this is a great supporting text for understanding this idea of inheritance and where it actually comes from. We're not making this up. So in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, uh, it, it it, 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 unlay, it lays out for us, and it says this, For all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. And so just for context in Galatians 3, what he's talking about here is uh, when, he, when he talks about works, he's talking about like strict obedience to the law. And the law is the law of the Old Testament, the, the rules that are laid out in the first five books of the Bible. Okay, so that's just context. So for all who rely on that strict obedience, perfect obedience to those first five book, all those rules and law are under the curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Also, every time you see quotes, he's literally quoting the Old Testament. Clearly, verse 11, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because, quote, the righteous will live by faith. Verse 12, so the law is not the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, if a person who does these things will live by them, Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham way back when, the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that's you and me, us, 
through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Then he listens to this, and he calls us brother. He says, "Listen, brothers and sisters." Let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. So in other words, like, we can't go back and, and go before what has already been established. The promise, verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture doesn't say and, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean to say is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. And here, is, here it is, verse 18. For if the inheritance, there it is again, if the inheritance depends on the law, then, then, then it no longer depends on the promise, that, that promise given by God, the covenantal promise given by God to Abraham. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. So the promise of our inheritance is as sons and daughters, not as workers. And as sons and daughters, it is received by grace through faith. So now, let's go back to Colossians 3, verse 24. Because, because we have to understand this. It says that, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Okay, that literally says, out of the original Greek test, the first phrase is, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. Do you understand that? So it says, so since knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. Does that make sense? That's how that connects. We can't get that backwards. We can't. We got to get this straight or else we never understand work. It's so cool. It means that it isn't our work on this earth that rectifies us with God. It is Jesus' work on the cross that has reconciled us to God. And that completely reshapes work for us. And he says, and since you know, it means that that term literally means since you have a deep understanding, grasp of this spiritual truth, now you get to go work. That means until we fully grasp the spiritual truth of, of our inheritance not being attached to our work, Work will be used as a source of validation. Our performance will be derived from a place of obligation and our sense of worth will be dominated by others' perception. But now that we know that it's from the Lord that we've received this reward of his inheritance, verse 23 comes into context. And verse 23 says this. So whatever you do, pick something Go for it. Knock yourself out. It's going to be great. Because it's not going to be what defines you. It's not going to be the thing that makes you fulfilled and all have purpose. Whatever you do, go, go for it. He says, whatever you do, because the gospel brings dignity to all work, even tedious work, even work that can seemingly be mundane to you. It's all good. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Because you know what? Excellence, not perfection, honors God and inspires others others. So go for it. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Give it all you got. That means, man, if you're a baker that's a Christian, bake great bread. If you're a teacher who's a follower of Jesus, pour your lives into kids. If you're a pilot who's a Christian, man, land the plane every single time, <laughs> right? It's great. We will be so grateful. We'll love it. 
Whatever you do, you get to do it with all your heart. Because where we get to work for God, not man, as working for the Lord, not human masters. And there is such freedom there. Knowing full well that our inheritance as sons and daughters, chosen people, members of the body, that our inheritance is received by grace through faith, not by works. So now how can we participate in this new identity that Christ has given us? Here's four, uh, four ways I'd ask you to, to consider. Uh, and I want to go back. I told you we'd look at Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Here's uh, some application for us. How we be- begin to live into this new identity. Sons and daughters, chosen people, uh, members of one body. Four Ps. Number one, the first P, put on love. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, then clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness and patience and bear with each other and forgive one another. If anybody has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Your first P is put on love. Sometimes we chase the attributes of of God and Jesus without just receiving him. Put on the attributes of Jesus by putting on Jesus. Love is the stitching that holds all of your clothes together. Don't try to do one without the other. So number one, put on love. Number two, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Number two, practice gratitude. Man, Being thankful is not an emotion, it's a choice. Are you practicing gratitude? Number three, and let the message of Christ, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Number three is preach the gospel. He says, may the message of Jesus dwell. There's that word again, abide. May the message of Jesus abide among us richly as we get to teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And then fourthly, and praise God together. So we're teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. So we're praising God together, singing with psalms and hymns with gratitude in our hearts, and we're hearing the gospel and it's dwelling among us richly. What's that sound like to you? (laughs) Yeah, it's what we're doing right now, right? That's because what we do right now is important. It really is. Like, We gather together as the body once a week and we don't do it because we're kind of making it up and we're trying. No, we do it because we are instructed to because we know that it's vital to living correctly. What we do here on Sunday is so vital to how we live out Monday through Friday and even Saturday. It is. Our time together needs, must inform, influence our Monday through Friday. And so often we come in and we're like playing catch up, right? We at Monday through Friday just hammer us and we come and we just drag ourselves in to Sunday morning, which is great, man. If that's what you need and that's why you're here this morning, wonderful, man. I'm so glad that we can be together as a body of Christ for you when you're like that. But man, wouldn't it be cool if it was the other way around? Where, where what we got to do and be together on Sunday morning, like that actually informed our Monday through Friday. And it was this well that we just got to go and live out Monday. You, you know what I mean? Like what if we reversed those steps? Instead of trying to recover from the week, what if we were so filled that we just got to pour out throughout the week?
This is a, uh, I, I, I would say this is such a sneaky lie. So life gets busy and crazy and hectic for us. And work is hard. We need a break. What's the first thing that we cut out? Church on Sunday morning. And here I am, this is not like the preacher trying to guilt trip us. Like I know that life is real and things are happening. But it is. It's like our first, it's my inclination and I get paid to be here. <laughs> right? It's like, oh my, oh my, it's such a crazy week. Let's just stay home today so we can rest. It's a, man, it's a sneaky lie. The one thing that's going to give context to how we live and what we do, this, like, this vital piece to actually functioning Monday through Friday in a healthy manner, we were like, oh, we don't need it. Let's cut it out. It is so important. Because whatever you do, verse 17, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Did you put on love? Did you practice gratitude? Did you preach the gospel? And praise God together. Because the gospel means that what you do is not who you are. In Christ, you are new creations with new identities. You are brothers and sisters. You are chosen people. You are members of one body. And that means that we just get to work with all of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you've created good works for us in advance, that we get to walk into those, but, they, but that they do not define us. Lord, I pray that we would experience that freedom. Lord, I pray that whatever, uh, whatever else we might be trying to place our identity in, be it work or relationship or school or status, or whatever it is, if it's not you, would you show us? Lord, that stuff can creep in, and we need help. Help us to rest in you and work from a place that serves you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.